I thought I would do something a little bit different for today's video since we have a free week. And so I am going to read a few passages from If I Lie to give you a little taste of what the book is about. This is from chapter one of If I Lie. Harry Breen is MIA. His tongue weighs each word to cause the most pain. My father's news drops like a bomb, blasting the air from my lungs, and everything in me shrieks, not Carrie. My dresser bites into my backbone. I deflate, clamping my fingers around the Nikon to hide how they tremble. I want to throw up, but my father blocks escape to the bathroom, his shoulders spanning the doorway. Late February morning sun slips through the window blinds and swathes his perma-sunburned face in blades of light and dark, shadow camouflage. My stomach twists and sweat slides down my sides. He doesn't care what this news does to me, how it destroys me. His chin's up, wintergreen eyes narrowed under sparse blonde eyebrows, hairline retreating from neat rows of lines crossing his forehead. I'm barely holding it together, and he doesn't bother to hide his disappointment at my reaction to his words. His lips thin. Quinn, did you hear me? Yes, sir. Carrie is MIA, sir. Since the scandal six months ago, that scandal we don't speak of, my father says Carrie's name with reverence. They are two Marines, two men who fought for a freedom I no longer feel. Comrades betrayed by the women they left behind. Sand and grit have rubbed between the pleasantries and Carrie's emails since I stopped answering him weeks ago. We're leaving Camp Leatherneck soon. Please don't tell. We'll be patrolling roads, clearing IEDs. Something big's coming. I miss you. You may not hear from me for a while. God, I don't want to die. You must be busy with school and all. Talk to me, Quinn. I hope to hear from you soon. Carrie could be a hostage. He could be dead, his brown body abandoned and decaying in a foreign country. The town has watched the CNN reports on Operation Mashtrak for the last week, tracking Carrie's battalion, the 1-6, as waves of Chinooks dropped troops into Marja. Rockets, machine gun fire, mortars, and IEDs met them. I've held my breath for days trying to pick Carrie out in the news footage. What if? Not Carrie. His parents must be destroyed. They know by now, if my father knows. How did they react? The Marines would have sent at least one soldier to the Breen's house. And I imagine how Mr. Breen looked hearing the news. Evaluating. Slow and methodical, his eyes focused on the ceiling to hide his thoughts. When composed, he would catch his wife's worried gaze. And Mrs. Breen would know as if she waited, expected the worst to happen. Her body would fold, welcoming sadness, drowning in it, and Mr. Breen would support her, catching her before she hit the ground. If she blamed me before, it will now be a thousand times worse. I can't even grieve for Carrie, not where people can see me. Carrie has sewed my mouth shut. Please don't tell. Nice girls don't cheat on their hero boyfriends. Damn you, Carrie. Quinn, my father sounds impatient. My rage blows away, leaving hopelessness in its place. I heard you, sir. You're not going to leave the house unless it's to go to school or to work. People are going to be in a lot of pain when they find out. I don't want your presence making them feel worse. You've done enough, you hear me? I nod, he's right. Nobody will want to see me. Today I will not go to Grave Woods. I set the Nikon on the dresser behind me, among the neat pile of lenses and memory cards. My hands feel useless without my camera, void. My father assumes I'll obey. His uniform has starched his backbone so straight, he walks tall, even in faded jeans, and a worn marine, the few, the proud sweatshirt. Lieutenant Cole Quinn's orders, like the Ten Commandments, are disobeyed at your own peril. His eyes narrow to two dashes and sweep my room, 
They land on the bed with its sheets and blanket tucked military style as he taught me. The dresser with its clean top. Nothing out of place. No thing to criticize except me. I cannot remember the last time his eyes stayed on mine. After I was browned, the town slit, he looks through me. Maybe if we both wish hard enough, I will become invisible with watery veins and glass bones. My translucent heart will beat on, but my father will not notice. He sees only my mother in the spaces around me. In this next scene, Quinn has been asked not to attend a candlelight vigil for her boyfriend, Carrie. And she's leaving school rather upset about it when she bumps into two of her former friends, Blake and Angel. Blake is standing in the hall with Angel as I head for the exit, and I avoid their eyes. Q? Worry punches holes in Blake's usual bitter tone, but I ignore him. I don't stop until I'm in my Jeep and pulling away from the school. It's only when I see my reflection in the rearview mirror that I realize I'm crying. I'm not sure where to go. Home is out, since my father could show up there at any time. People in town would call the school to narc on me for ditching. I drive to the northern side of Sweet Haven. At the edge of Grave Woods, I pull off the road and into a copse of trees. My tires have worn grooves into the mud over the past couple of months. In seconds, I'm parked out of sight of anyone passing on the road. Safe. Lost. George's Nikon somehow ends up in my hand, and I strip it of its case, tossing my bag of equipment over my shoulder. It's cold but bearable as I trek the half hour into the woods to the graveyard. With only three graves and said to be haunted, the tiny plot is little more than a few mounds of melting snow bowing to long forgotten headstones. Nobody knows who Josephine, Thomas, or Susie were, but it's obvious from the sad state of the stones that they died long ago. Somehow, I feel less alone when I come here. Snow can be difficult to shoot, but those wasting piles untouched by tires are where I focus. If I'm not careful, the pictures will appear too dark or the snow will come out of a shade of blue. The trick is to overexpose, to fool the camera into thinking there's more light than there really is. Not so different for me. I fooled everyone into thinking I'm more than I really am. I adjust the ISO setting and use my exposure compensation dial. Then I linger like George has taught me. Everyone takes the picture of the kid with the birthday cake on his face, he said once. Wait for the unexpected. That's the magic. So I crouch and I wait, expelling my breath into my scarf. My right calf cramps and my hip clicks when I shift to ease the discomfort. It's silent until something moves above me. A crow perches on a branch a mere 10 feet away, unaware it is a living, breathing graveyard cliche. I snap its picture and I remember a nursery rhyme my mother used to lull me to sleep when a song could still do the trick. One for sorrow, two for joy, three for a girl, four for a boy, five for silver, six for gold, seven for a secret never to be told. The crow looses a shrill caca that is answered in duplicate. Suddenly, a murder of crows is launching out of the treetops, their blue-black feathers flicking white powder into the air. My finger is fast on the trigger, shooting as many pictures as I can. Unlike that rhyme, I don't believe the number of birds I see will determine my fate. But that doesn't stop me from counting them through the viewfinder as they wing away. Seven. Seven for a secret never to be told. Okay, I'm skipping ahead a few chapters to chapter nine to read a scene with George. He's one of my favorite characters in the book. And in this scene, um, George is a veteran at the VA hospital where Quinn's dad has made her work um, as punishment for what has happened. And so she spends a lot of time with him working on the Veterans History Project where they are archiving and collecting the stories of soldiers that are in the hospital. And just so you know, George calls her by her first name, Sophie. Quinn is actually her last name. So, 
George cheats at cards. His eyes stray toward my cards, and I angle my hand closer to my chest, glaring at him. Go fish. He takes a card off the top of the deck on the table and frowns. More than just about anything, he hates to lose, and I have to watch him closely so cards don't stray up his sleeve or under the blanket on his lap. Do you have a nine? His brow smooths out, and he gives me an angelic smile. Go fish, Soph. I know he's lying, and he knows I know he's lying. I raise an eyebrow at him. Seriously, George, you're going to play it like that? Like what, he asks all innocence. We're not even betting money on this. He tilts his head toward the fun-sized candy bars piled on his bedside tray. Those things are currency around here. Now shut up and draw, kid. Placing my elbows on the table, I lean forward until my face is in his. Swear on your Cubans that you don't have a nine. I'm not sure how he gets them, but George has a steady supply of Cuban cigars. He loves them, but obviously not as much as he loves winning. I swear, he says, solemnly placing a hand over his heart. He manages to hold my gaze for all of five seconds before his eyes drop. As soon as he looks away, I steal a glance at his hand. Not only does he have a nine, he also has an ace and a queen he told me he didn't have. You lie like a dog, George. Give me the nine, and while you're at it, give me that ace and the queen. Caught, he grins shamelessly and passes me the cards without argument. He groans when I smack down three pairs, finishing off my hand and pulling all the candy toward me. I win, I crow. That makes five hands, right? Four. He crosses his arms while I do a miniature victory lap around the room. He's scowling but doing a bad job at hiding a smile. All right, smartass. Quit being a poor winner and hand me those photos. The pictures are part of the Veterans History Project we've been working on since we met last year. We're helping Private Don Baruth in room 309 compile his mementos from his days fighting in the Korean War as part of the Army's 8th Cavalry, 1st Cavalry Division. Each piece of memorabilia has to be documented and Don's story has to be written up before we can submit his collection to the Library of Congress. I drop the pictures onto George's lap and resume my seat on the side of the bed where his legs should be. It used to bother me, that missing leg. This one is amazing, I say, pulling a photo from the pile. George studies it. The black and white shot features only a dirty helmet and the arm of an unseen soldier. George traces the arm lost in memory. The images do this to him often, taking him back in time to things he'd rather forget and doesn't like to talk about. It's of a North Korean soldier Don had just shot in a skirmish along the Nakdong River near Chinggu. The soldier is dead. Peering closer, see the ground is a mixture of mud and what has to be blood. I hadn't realized. I picture Don as I'd seen him the week before. In his 80s at least, he has more liver spots than hair. His skin sags with the weight of age, and his hands shook when he patted my arm to thank me for bringing him a cup of water. Why did he keep it? That seems a little creepy. He didn't want to forget how awful it felt to kill someone. I say nothing. I can't imagine what it would be like to kill another human being. Someone who had a family who loved them. Somebody's son and maybe somebody's father. I wonder if Carrie has had to kill anyone. Or worse, has someone killed Carrie? I shiver, though it's not cold. George sighs and takes a deep breath to pull himself back to the present. Why do you think this photo is amazing? I pause, studying the picture. He tests me like this sometimes to see what I've learned. It's haunting. You can only see part of the person in the helmet. It's like the photographer is making a statement about what's not there instead of what is. And maybe the photographer is a little scared to show reality, like it's too horrific to really look at what happened to that soldier. Does that make sense? George's face creaks into a smile. You have good instincts, so. Let's look at this one. He passes me another photo, and we fall into a comfortable rhythm. He points out the things I miss about composition and focus and lighting. I hang on to his words, wrapping my mind around the lesson and my heart around a moment of kindness from a man who is not my father.